So people think they've showed you how to pack wheel bearings or tapered roller bearings correctly. And what I see is people taking a great big handful of grease, putting the bearing into it and then trying to force grease into the bearing. That's not, not how, how I got trained to do it. Now there is tools that you pack with grease, put a bearing in and then it forces it through the grease and that's what they're trying to emulate. But if you've been trained properly, like I was, this is how to do it. First you need to find some grease and well, that's got hardly anything left in it and that's got hardly anything left in it and well I haven't used this for years I hate grease I really hate it and that's not great but it's okay so I want to transfer what's in here into there I will say before somebody comments that this aged grease is not best to use in your car. I'm just showing an example of how to fill wheel bearings. I'm not showing an example of what state grease should be in fit to use for an automobile. This wheel bearing on this wheel here is for a machine mover and may move machines a hundred meters maybe a kilometer in its life and its speed will never exceed the speed with which you can push it at or pull it at so forklift speed at slow at best not a critical situation grease transferred <coughs> Usually when I'm adjusting a wheel bearing, I use a pair of channel lock pliers, but not everybody has access to channel lock pliers. I find them the easiest. And I happen to have a pair of side cutting pliers here for adjusting the split pin afterwards. To get wheel bearings out, you tend to have no load on it and just punch the wheel at the side and the bearing gets ejected. It's sometimes best to have something clean to put it down on. You always want to keep the inside of your bearings clean. And the grease you're putting in should be clean as well. And you want to be keeping your washer clean and your nut clean as well. Then we take the wheel off. And of course, ridiculously, I've pressed the seal in. So regreasing that one's even harder. Extremely difficult, to be fair. So let me just get that back out again. And we will proceed. Okay, seal removed. That's entirely other subject getting seals out without damaging them. <coughs> this is the inner wheel bearing. It is bigger than the outer wheel bearing. That's normally the case with tapered roller bearings. So the idea is you need to fill that bearing so all those gaps, see the gaps in between, are filled. And you don't want to be messing about. You just want to get in there and get it done. I am in front of the camera. Well, I'm behind the camera and you're in front of the camera, so I'm reaching around it. I will try my hardest to keep you in view. Let me just get the view find out how I can see it. There, I can see it now, so it's all upside down, but here we go. All right, grease. I'm not going to pack my hands. One finger spread into the gap. Force in. 
spread back into the gap and force in. And there's a feeling to this, you get the feeling. So you put it in and you force it into the gap. And you notice how little amount of grease I've got out of the chamber to do this. I haven't filled my hand with it and then stuck it back in afterwards, which is a really bad practice. I've got out just the right amount that I require to do the first outer race. And you just keep on wiping it in. And once you wipe it in, what you're doing is you're forcing it through the gaps. And you see there's still bits left on my fingers. So wipe what you've got left on your finger on top and then just use your finger and force it towards the grease bulge. Let me see if I can get a closer. So there's a bulge there, small, small bulge. Force it towards the bulge and try and force in at the same time. And what happens is it slowly comes out to this side of the bearing. So I'm going to carry on doing that until I've seen it come through. It will actually come through this side and it will start bursting out of the side of the bearings shortly. So let's just carry on doing that. And you can see it starting to come through now. So we'll get you in there. If you look, you can see the grease starting to come through the bearings. So you start from the back, and after you're sure you've got it most of the way through the bearings, I hope you can see that. There you go, yeah, I'm pretty certain you can see that now. So the grease is near enough all the way through the bearings, yeah? Doesn't take long. But I haven't got more grease out of the container than I need. And I know it's a bit of a mess down the side here, but I can see this one's protruding, this one isn't. So I'll just carry on doing the big side for a little bit longer. And then once I'm happy that the big side's done, it's just a matter of filling the small side in, which doesn't take long. Quick wipe around the outside, bang the bearing in. So let me just carry on and do that. Right, quite happy at that. I've got it completely spewing out on that one. 99% on most of them, all the way to this side. So now I'll just do the same on this side. And then just to finish the packing off, then you go around the outside and you do the same around the outside of the bearing. You just fill in the last little bit of gap that you can't quite get by doing the first two movements. And you just go around the outside. You know, you know full well that you've done the inside perfectly because when you start from the big side, you can see it come through to the small side. You've just filled the small side up completely. You can see that's done. And now you're just filling those little last little gaps up that you just couldn't quite get. And you can see I haven't took grease out the pot since the last lot because I realised I've got enough on my finger then, just from experience. And the amount of waste which is going to go into the rag in a second. So you just wipe the last little bit around the outside and then wipe a bit around. You can't see that I think. I'm not sure if you can see that or not. There we go. So you just wipe a little bit around the face, drop the bearing in. If you really want to now, you can fill it with grease. 
Then there's a procedure for filling seals. Now this seal is extremely difficult. So, for a start, this is a lip seal. Okay. I'm sure this, yeah, this is a double lip seal. Now, if you weren't wearing gloves, wiping your finger around the seal, although you don't think it does a lot, it will take the lip off. These, these seals are engineered items and they have a lip on them and it is to seal. There's a lip on the outside to seal debris from going in and there's a lip on the inside to stop grease coming out. If you just go in there and wipe your finger around, your fingerprints are sharp enough to wear that rubber away and to degrade that lip seal straight away. This is how to grease a lip seal. You get a little bit of grease on your finger or oil if you're doing for oil and you dab do not wipe never wipe a lip seal dab 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 no wiping involved at all no wiping at all okay The other thing you need to know about lip seals is they have a spring. Um, let's look at that. So there's a spring around there. To, re to prevent that pinging off, if you're worried about it pinging off, you can actually feel fill the inside of the seal there with grease. And the grease will stop the spring from pinging off when you're installing it with the install tool or the hammer, like I do, because I've always done them with by hand. I've never had the tool. I've got taught how to do it by hand. I don't know how to do it. I'm not going to show you everything to do with seal. I just wanted them to iterate on top of this video that lip seals are delicate things in certain areas. Anyway, some people right now would fill the back of that up with grease. There's no need to because what's going to happen is there's too much grease in that bearing now, it will chuck it out. I guarantee you, it will just chuck it out. But you can, there'll do no harm, just get some grease and wiping around there and filling the back up. All you're going to do with a car if you're doing that is just fill the cap for the grease <laughs> and make a mess the next time you're coming to do it. And by the way if you've got this type of bearing these should be done every three to six thousand miles regardless of what people say every three to six thousand miles these bearings should be cleaned and adjusted. Right so there you go some grease in there now Put the seal in, and this particular seal, because I've made this wheel, I know full well, goes in with your fingers, not a problem at all. And that's how much waste I've got. Now I know a lot of people will be saying, but those greasing tools that you get and they're very good are a lot quicker and they are a lot quicker in some respect depends on how many wheel bearings you're doing and how prepared you are to clean the old grease out of them so I need to get this wheel bearing on there without damaging that seal so it's um, it's a task I'm going to show you it's a task But I made this shaft so I know what it can do. So there we go. It is on. I have the other bearing. It is pre-packed. But buying a greeting machine then going through the painstaking task of keeping it clean, it's beyond it. Now usually I will use a pair of channel lock pliers to adjust these. But today I will do it with a pair of these. Crescent wrenches, I think people call them. So what you do is you tighten the bearing up until it nips. You can feel the taper come out of it and there's nothing left. When it's tight, then you spin your wheel. Okay? And what that does is it evacuates any of the excessive grease and you feel it, eventually it gets a bit easier. And you can see it ejecting the grease. And you can always see the outer bearing. So it gets freer. 
unfortunately you can't feel the play but there'll be no play in that at all now because that is way too tight so after you've done that so we've just nipped it up and you feel the, the play come out of the taper the tape has come together and you feel it lock solid and you just touch that solidness you don't go anything past just touching you can just feel it go nip and it nips and then you go tight and then once you've done that rotational thing which you've just seen there you put your tool that you're using back on again you undo the bearing and you do the same thing again a few times just do it a few times and you get the feel for it and you can feel it just nip and do it again and do that a few times just reseat the bearing take it off it's a bit easier with a car because with this you're not really reseating it spin it again when there's no tension on it and bring it back up again and again just bring it up until it nips Spin it a few more times, undo and bring it up to it nips. Right, so it's now nipped and that is too tight. As the bearing heats up it will expand and that will then create more friction which will build up more heat which will expand even more. The bearing may get to 100 or 200 degrees centigrade under new, normal use. At that kind of temperature, the steel will expand by one or two thousandth of an inch. And you can't measure that because there's grease and everything inside there. So you've got to guesstimate it. So this is the rule of thumb. In your shaft, there's a split pin hole. Right, we might be lined up on one now. And we are, unfortunately. In some shafts, there's two split pin holes, and they're at 90 degrees to one another. And mine isn't 90 degrees to it, to other because I made the shaft. So I've got it one up to one, and I'm just going to back it off to the next because I've got a castle nut. Okay, because that's all I can do. Where is it? Where's the hole? There. So if you've got a castle nut, that's good enough. So you've brought it up until it's just nipped, literally touched you can feel it touch and then you figure out where your next hole is or if you've lined up to a hole but you just back it back one one notch until the, until the next notch is in your castle nut becomes exposed let me get the castle nut and explain it a bit better let get the castle nut off So this is a castellated nut. In the shaft there is holes drilled at 90 degrees. That's the way the shaft should be if you've got a castellated nut. So once you've nipped that nut up, if it is in line with the hole, don't put a split pin in it once you've nipped it up. You've got to back it off a little bit. So what you do is, you, if you know the first hole is at 12 o'clock, you'll know for sure the other one will be at 3 and 9 o'clock. If your first hole is at 1 o'clock, then you'll have to work out your timing of where it is. Because there's lots of grease everywhere and you can't really see things. So, you guess where it is. You get split pin, sometimes it's the easiest way. And as you back it off, just wiggle the split pin slightly, and then you'll feel it go in, and that's it. You just, just wand one little increment backwards whatever the first increment backwards is that is it now there's another type of wheel bearing and that will just have a normal nut so the normal nut will look similar to that although that's an engineered so you can see that's an engineered nut it will look similar to that on both sides just a standard nut but it will be around about that kind of thickness it will be not too thick and you do the same thing you nip it up and then they come with a cage, and the cage can slip on the nut at different angles, and they tend to only have one hole drilled through the shaft. And the way you set them up is, you nip it up, and through experience you bring it back about the same as what I've bought there, but you basically just put the cage on, see where the split pin alignment is, 
until you get a split pin in. If you can get if you can line it up so there's a split pin in, absolutely fantastic. Then you just put the cage back one clip, no, sorry, what forward one clip, and then turn the nut and back until it reinserts. That's good. If it doesn't line up, then you find the closest one which it doesn't line up onto, that you can just turn it back a little bit and slip it in. That's perfect. If you're paranoid, you can turn it back a little bit further. And on one of those cage ones, it's about finding the increments. I can't remember the exact determination of how to do it, but you get the gist. So anyway, the split pin's in. On a car wheel, you would be able to feel a little bit of play. And I can in this. There's just a little bit. Let me bring the camera down close to it and the, the view won't be very good but I think you'll hear the clicking. Give me a second. Right, you're pretty close now. I'm going to shut up and let's see if you can hear it clicking. No, you're not going to be able to. Yes, you can. There you go. Pretty certain I got that. Right. Split pins are one of those things that you have to do next. And there's two trains of thought on a split pin. Some people will insert their split pin this way. As it comes out, they'll leave it protruding like this. And then they'll flare one bit of the split pin one way and one bit of the split pin the other way. I, on the other hand, are of this type, so I will put the split pin in so the longest tang is towards you, like so. And that way you can just insert the split pin a little bit further. Then the long tang I'll grab and I'll put it towards me so it lays across the top of the threads, or if it's long enough I'll bend it over down the front of the threads. And then the bit that's sticking up that's left, I will just tap that backwards over the nut. So let's do that. So I'll use side cuts for this, just make sure the split pin is fully home. So put your thumb on the back of it, grab hold of it. Uh huh. I've span it, so you can't have it spinning because that is not good enough. So grab hold of it and pull it towards you. These little pliers are not good enough for this. I'm going to have to get some bigger ones. But saying that, I can do it. Just. I prefer bigger pliers than this, but I'm not getting tools out just to do this one job. No chance. So you get to out there, and then if I've got a bigger pair of side cutting pliers, I would just use that to bash it down, but these will not touch it. So I'll just use a hammer for today. So I'll just tap that down the front of it. This tang at the back here, you can use your pliers, I'll just use my pliers, but I'll just literally tap it down. And that's it, the wheel bearings is installed. There is a gnat's fanny of play, which you've heard, that's the way it is. After you've done all that, it's best to put your cap on. But I have just painted my caps. And I might destroy the paintwork. Although I'm never really that bothered about paintwork. Because paintwork. Oh yeah, cover your tin up. Paintwork is one of those things you can spend hours and hours and hours doing paintwork and still not be happy with it if it's perfect. Okay, I've got one off. We might try and store on it. Why not? It's on. There we go. That'll keep the grease out. It's got paint. It's got a paint seal. The person comes to get that off next. If it isn't me, it won't be on it. Well, that's a bit tight, isn't it? Not stuck on well. Yeah, it was painted on. <laughs> and obviously, your cap will probably not be a bolt on one like this. It'll probably be a knocking cap. I could not be bothered to find the measurements out of the engineer's handbook to 
figure out the way of putting a knock-on cap on. There we go. The job is complete. I've got to do one more on the other side. And my machine movers will be fully usable. Just going to add on most of the way through the second bearing. And in between each operation, it is critical that you check your hands for any debris. You want no grit in there at all. Oh, one more thing I'm going to add. This hammer, although it's not a engineering hammer, it's a woodworking hammer. Most important thing about any tool that you're using when you're doing wheel bearings is make sure it's clean. Cleansiness is everything. Don't get any dirt in your wheel bearings. Anything that goes close to that wheel bearing, make sure it's clean. For this particular session, I opened up a book to a page. It's a book I'm just going to chuck away now because I don't need it anymore. And I opened it to that page and there's bits of grease and all sorts of stuff on that page now. But it was clean before I started. And you want to make sure that you're using something clean to rest all your parts on. What I tend to do is... I'm get the cap back on again. It's coming off. When I take the cap off... I will rest the cap like that, inspect the inside of the cap for any debris. If it looks clean, then I pop all the parts inside the part inside the um, cap. So the nut, the washer, the front bearing will all go inside the cup while I'm waiting and doing whatever I'm doing, brakes or whatever I'm doing inside there. They will stay inside there until I come to the cleaning and rebuilding. Now it's best to take all the old grease out using engine degreaser then dry the part thoroughly and start the greasing process straight away which will force any of the moisture out from the degreasing process obviously the degreaser the engine degreaser i use is water soluble so you use water to wash it off with hot water and that evaporates and you don't want to leave that on the metal because it will flash rust so get the grease in get it on there as soon as possible Anyway, I'll leave the cleaning process up to you. You can clean stuff the way you want to clean it, but you need to get all the old grease out if it's contaminated at all, any contamination at all. You can put them back in with the old grease in and just repack them again from experience on how to repack a, an already slightly packed bearing. It's the same process. You just force the grease in until you can feel and see that no more grease is going inside the bearing and then it's full and you know that because the grease doesn't disappear while you're working it a few more tips there there's you know there's many 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 more things you crop up against when you're doing wheel bearings many things but there we go installing wheel bearings is another thing entirely i do them manually with a punch but again Doing a wheel bearing manually with a punch is not for the faint hearted and although I've installed thousands and thousands of bearings I think I have destroyed four maybe five just because the punch slipped down the face of the bearing and if it does it marks it, it's game over, need a new bearing you have to go into the boss and go sorry boss I slipped with the punch and it's gone down the side of the bearing and need a new bearing please. And some bearings are expensive, very expensive. Anyway, there we go. Both my wheel bearings are done. Happy days. Onwards and upwards, on to the next project. Whatever that will be, I don't know. But if I can think of something else, I can give helpful tips to people with I will do a video on it as and when I get time or as and when it fits in to me doing stuff I've got three or four videos on YouTube now which are full on how to's like this and I don't mean to say that this is the best way of doing it but the person that trained me knew what he was doing <laughs> and that's the way I do it I'm sure the person before him, who trained him, did it exactly the same way. 
and I think the person before him wasn't working on cars because they probably weren't invented then. So, and these wheel bearings aren't on cars very much anymore these days. You tend to get um, deep groove roller bearings now, which are preloaded, and you have to torque up to a specific torque um, to get the amount of preload that you're supposed to have on them. Fortunately, the, unfortunately, the boxes that they come in don't have the torque setting on them anymore, and you have to go to a manufacturer's specification. And getting that can sometimes be difficult if you don't work at the main dealer. Another subject entirely: tapered roller bearings. That's how to fit them.